Sure. Uh, here we go. I clap so you can turn the lights on. Wow, look at how brilliant. It's so bright and colorful. Try not to fall asleep. So, um, yeah, so we are actually in the maple squirrel moon right now. So, uh, uh, the indigenous have the names of a lot of moon. Hey, Jane Shippy, I worked with Jane. <laughs> Hey Jane, it's me, Chris. Um, anyway, so <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll let you go over there if you want to, or, or whatever. You can you can do the pop up stuff. Okay. Um, I know everyone is coming in, which is kind of nice. So <laughs> Jane's here, Art's here. Um, so uh, right before the maple uh, squirrel moon is something called the hunger moon, right? And so it's the February where all the stores are kind of running low and you just don't have a lot of food um, uh, uh, to eat. So I'm trying to figure out, I had this working, what happened? It just stopped. Well, now I have to push buttons. We're, oh, I think because we messed up the presentation. <laughs> Which one do you want me to press? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's... Oh, right there. There's your arrow for the next one. Right, but I had this. Ooh. There we go. But I it's think it's, if next time we touch something, it's going to disconnect this. Okay, I will. Joy's in the back also admitting yeah. people. The only problem, sorry folks online, we might not be able to hide that bar. You see a gray thing, that's just yeah. the way it's going to be. So this is the Audubon Society, and I thought I'd start with a uh, painting by um, John James Audubon, um, and a lot of people think that he only painted birds, but he did not. He has an entire book on quadrupeds, and not only does he have an entire book on quadrupeds, <laughs> he has lots of squirrel paintings, and, and, and in fact, people complain um, how many squirrel paintings. So I've got, you know, you can open this up, and there's like five, ten pages of squirrels, and he said, I can't avoid squirrels. They're so well represented in, in, in as, a, as a family that they just need to be they just need to be painted. Uh, this is one of my favorites, the, the Eastern Chipmunk, uh, and uh, and the label at the bottom calls these uh, chipping squirrels. So these were called chipping squirrels. Um, and there's a oh, I thought I let Jane in. Okay, this might mess up. Oh, it didn't. Okay, okay. that's good. <laughs> Uh, so, so they, they were called, but now we call them chipmunks, but chipmunk is actually just a, a mistaken interpretation. So uh, it's thought that the chipmunk comes from the Ojibwe word jitamu or a, a jitamu, a jitamu in, in Ottawa. Uh, and jitamu uh, means little upside downer. It's it's basically the way that a red squirrel runs down a tree is where that word comes from, jitamu. And if you and if you hear it pronounced, it's like jit jitamu, jitamu. Uh, and this N H at the end kind of is like chitamu, jitamu. And and so it's thought that white people just thought, well, sounds like chipmunk. Okay, so it sounds like chipmunk. So what we call a chipmunk is actually a red squirrel in Ottawa, in, in, in Ojibwe. Um, what Audubon called red squirrels was chicory, and chicory sounds a little bit like jitamu as well. And so a chicory is an old world, uh, an old word for a red for a red squirrel. What I love about Audubon's painting is chipmunks actually do climb trees, and they do run down the tree head first. And so it's not totally off base that you have a little upside downer in the chipmunk, but really every time I see a chipmunk, I think stupid white person that just got the name wrong. Um, and it's, it's really what we're talking about a red squirrel. If you've read red squirrel, um, there's a wonderful book. Red 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 in there is, is the uh, maple sugar apple. 
uh, where he she was. He said that our people learned from the squirrels. Um, and, and so we have uh, this other, just this lesson of learning from the squirrels. What you can't see here behind this is a red squirrel um, there. Uh, so there's a, um, an Iroquois legend where an Iroquois woman was watching a red squirrel and the red squirrel made an incision in the, in the, in the, in the bark of a maple tree and then licked the sap. Uh, and this was right around now. Okay, so we're coming out of the hunger moon into the sugar moon. This is when squirrels are hungriest because they've eaten up all their stores. And so they nip a bud and they get the sap to run uh, and then they, they, they drink the sap. And, and Indians learn how to, to tap sugar um, by watching squirrels. <clears throat> so this 1992 paper um, in the Journal of Mammalogy by Bert Heinrich, University of Vermont, um, basically had the, he had this like epiphany. It's like, hey, red squirrels, uh, they, they tap sugar. I'm like, really? Indigenous people have known this for thousands of years. And here you go, hey, like, good job, Burns. I'm not picking on Burns. I'm not, I'm not picking on Burns. But, but this, is, this is a story that we know a lot about. Um, Susan said that I worked um, uh, with the San Diego Zoo, uh, captive raising peccaries. These were endangered peccaries uh, that were discovered in 1976 by a guy from the University of Connecticut. But they were, he discovered them because he found bones in an indigenous cooking pile. He said, hey, this is like an extinct species. And they're like, hey, no, it's not. We eat it all the time. Um, and, and so it's new to science, right? So, um, so he just, he's the first that published it. But even Burnt was like, oh, they're super selective on maple sugar trees. I don't see them tapping other trees. And again, not true. Red squirrels will tap all sorts of trees. Uh, 23 species of trees have been um, shown to be tapped uh, by red squirrels. And they've got different ways that they'll do this. They'll take an incisor and they'll make a, just a mark. Um, and then they'll let the sap flow. This is one thing Burnt talked about. They'll let the sap flow, but they won't drink the sap. They'll go away and let that sap evaporate and turn into like maple candy. And then they'll come back and, and eat the candy off the tree or lick the evaporated sap because it's a little bit denser in sugar. So these are things that uh, squirrels will do. But again, maple trees aren't the only trees that produce sap, right? Every tree pretty much does this. Uh, this is a black birch, um, and this is just one way that they'll do it. So they're not all of this chisel marks, so they'll kind of like rip anything to get um, to get at this layer and get some sap, um, uh, sap running. Now your burgers, and so you're probably thinking, well, squirrels aren't the only thing that tap trees. Um, there's an entire bird called a sap sucker, and and, and, uh, and I'll just kind of tell you a little bit. Um, uh, the difference between a sap sucker and a squirrel is. One's a mammal and one's a bird, but that's not what I was going to say. What, uh, the, the squirrels are, are getting at the xylem sap. So the xylem, uh, the xylem sap, when the snow is melting right now, you'll see, and this is uh, Robin Wall Kimmler talks about this in her book too, you'll notice a pattern around your trees that the snow seems to kind of melt around the trees first. You probably notice that around your house too, the snow melts away from the house, it melts around the trees first. That's because the sun is hitting the dark house and the dark bark of the tree, and that radiant heat is basically melting the snow around the tree um, before the rest of the yard, right? Um, that's going to get the, um, uh, the, the water is going to become available to the tree, and, and the, it's going to be coming up to feed those buds. So there's sugar that's stored in the roots, and I have a plant taxonomist in the room. But maybe he's not a plant physiologist, so if you maybe he won't knock me on, on my <laughs> if, I, if I get some of the physiology wrong. But but the, these new buds need energy. You know, they need energy to open. They're not photosynthesizing yet. So the xylem sap is going to run up, carry sugar from the roots to the, the, the new buds. That's what we're doing. That's when we're tapping for maple syrup right now. Um, that's what we're doing. The sap sucker is going deeper. They're going for the phloem sap. Flow of sap is where now the 
leaves are out, they're producing sugar through photosynthesis, and they're sending it through the tree. Um, and, and, and so they're digging these holes here to get to, get to that. It's actually probably even um, a higher sugar content. I don't know, I've never actually measured it, but it's a different type of sap that's gonna be available year round as well. Actually the xylo sap is too, but whatever, different sap. Okay, you with me so far? Any questions on sap? Is there everything you wanted to know about sap? Okay. Now I was talking to a friend of mine, Andy Lickle, um, who's got a sugar bush, and I don't know if you know people that have sugar bush, and I was telling him, I'm giving a talk on squirrels and how they taught us to make sugar uh, maple syrup. He's like, is that why they're always messing with my, my sugar bags? And so if you actually do, um, does anyone tap sugar? Anyone kind of do that? You ever had a squirrel just kind of like messing with your stuff? They don't always mess with your stuff. Um, but this was in 2019. There were all sorts of articles on the web about how destructive the squirrels were in Vermont uh, to the sugar industry. Um, and so this is if you've ever been in a sugar bush, there's, there's all sorts of tubes and everything's kind of going through the central. You know, you've got hundreds of trees tapped. Um, and they'll kind of like cut through there um, and they'll kind of like destroy some of your tapping equipment. Um, so this is one paper the squirrels have declared war. Squirrels are damaging <laughs> maple syrup operations. When I was looking online, they were all in March of 2019. And I thought, what was going on in spring of 2019 that led to World War, World War III? <laughs> I just came up with that. <laughs> um, out in Vermont. And, and so um, I was thinking, you know, so you have high densities of squirrels, but not a lot of food on the landscape, and they're going to the sugar because the sugar is like what's available. It's starvation food for a squirrel. So this guy, um, I, I read a couple blogs, um, and this, I saw this image, and this is a kind of nice image, um, and it's actually an image from GBIF, and I'll, I'm gonna tell you what GBIF is in just a second. Uh, but he downloaded all this data from GBIF to show that in 2019, 2020, squirrels, uh, as a percentage of um, images that were being shared, I'll talk about that in a second, were really high. So squirrel populations just, or squirrel images were high. People saw a lot of squirrels is what that says. Okay. Now, what's GBIF? So has anyone ever heard of iNaturalist? Okay, has anyone ever used iNaturalist or Seek, which is kind of like the other app that's attached to iNaturalist? So um, it's very common. It's, it's how I learned my, my mushrooms and my fungi. It's really good for that. It's really good for plants. It can be used for birds and mammals, but it's they run around really fast. I'm better with insects on a, on a, on a plant. I'll get some pictures of that. Um, but when you're, oops, I should probably figure that out. Um, When you take a picture and upload something to iNaturalist, a couple things are happening. So this is, I was having my mate or my tea up at Tree Haven and a red squirrel ran by and it didn't know I was there. It was like 5.30 in the morning. I didn't expect to see that. And, um, and so I just got my camera out and I took a picture and I uploaded it to um, iNaturalist, okay? So this is my iNaturalist account and it's going to um, have um, some, uh, these are different occurrences of red squirrels um, here. Uh, and a couple of things you can't see just behind this banner here, it says research grade. And so when you, anytime you take a picture behind the scenes, there's curators. There's people that are saying, yes, what you said was a red squirrel is actually a red squirrel. Or no, that's something else. Um, I'm going to give it another, it's another name. In our department, uh, one of Bob's predecessors, or one of Bob's um, successors, thank you, um, Stephanie Lyons, is one of those curators, okay? So almost everything that points students um, identify in Schmeekly up at Treehaven, she's just there, and you'll see her name pop up, identifying and verifying all the plants that our students are doing, um, and getting them basically to 
a research grade, but that, that is a good ID now. Now, when it becomes a good ID, something very interesting happens that you probably don't know about, okay? Um, well, first, if you go to your iNaturalist account, and I'm a little bit frightened to get out of this screen because we got it working now, so I don't want to go to the internet and mess it up, but I do. Um, so these are all of the red squirrels. So they're geotagged. Something that your phone will do is it'll give it a, a, a location. Like, okay, I've got a red squirrel. I've got a date. I've got a time. I've got a location. All of that data is attached to that image that you took. Curators verified it. Um, now it can be mapped. And so now we've got a very quick and easy distribution of red squirrels uh, and, um, and where they are. If I go to this link, um, which is just the red squirrel link that I, that I have, I can zoom in to my backyard and I will find two things. I'll find a picture I took of a red squirrel and it'll be the picture I took of the red squirrel. And I'll find an audio recording I made of the red squirrel. So now you can share audio too. So for birders, audio is pretty good. How many of you use Merlin um, as an app for song identification? It's wonderful. It's machine learning. iNaturalist is also machine learning. The more people that are using it, the better the IDs, the better, uh, the better they perform. Okay. So you can record that Eastern Bluebird that you weren't quite sure what it was, but now you've recorded it. And you can upload that recording, also geotagged, It'll be listened to by experts. It'll be given a research grade, and that will also be shared. And um, where it's shared uh, is GBIF. Okay, GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Okay, all of these occurrences get harvested and sent to like this central place that is globally searchable. So now I can go, and you can go too, there, and I can download all of the red squirrels. But not just the red squirrels that are harvested from iNaturalist, the red squirrels that have been collected in museum um, collections going back to the beginning of museum collections. What I want you to get out of this slide, though, is here's my museum collections in orange. Museum collected red squirrels. These are the human observations, primarily coming from iNaturalist. Everything that citizens are doing. You take a picture of a squirrel, it gets a research grade, it gets sent to this site, and now look what's happening. Almost all of our occurrences uh, for a lot of these things now are from you all. They're not from museum curators and people going out and collecting things like the olden days, the olden days, before 2015. <laughs> so. What's cool about iNaturalist, it was started by two grad students at Berkeley. Just two grad students had an idea. Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if you could take a picture of something, get an ID, and share that? Wouldn't that be cool? In 2015 or so, Cal Academy of Sciences said, yeah, that would be cool. In fact, we'll host that. We'll host it. And then in 2017, National Geographic said, that's really cool. We're going to support that. And so what you saw is, if you looked at, I started using um, iNaturalist way in the beginning. It's dumb. I was like, this is, it's getting everything wrong. This is the thing with machine learning. And then I came back a few years ago. It was like, oh, magic. I was like, that's what a meadow moon looks like. I mean, I was like really learning a, a lot. But you can see just after National Geographic picked it up, just how exponentially people are using it. I bring this up because the image that that guy shared, the person, I don't know who it was, shared showing in Vermont, squirrels numbers are going up. Part of that is user numbers are going up. There's a lot of people out there with cameras taking pictures of squirrels right now. And so I wanted a better um, idea of like what else, you know, where, what's a less biased idea. Are we, are we measuring squirrels or people taking pictures of squirrels? And for GBIF, I think it was people taking pictures of squirrels. So I went to another um, uh, project, Snapshot Wisconsin. How many of you have heard of Snapshot Wisconsin? Okay. So Snapshot Wisconsin 
Uh, there's 2,000 people around the state that have cam that host cameras. I host a camera in Sheekly. This is from Sheekly. Um, and every month or so, I go out and I swap out the car. I upload my pictures. I identify my pictures. The camera's not biased. The camera's going to take a picture of whoever walks by. Um, in this case, a squirrel. Okay. Um, and so now I can go to um, my camera because I, I have the data from my camera. Um, and I can, okay, I put my camera out in 2018. So that's like, uh, it was May of 2018. Um, and these are just my squirrels. So I can look at, okay, how many squirrel pictures do I have from Snapshot Wisconsin? And she, first of all, during the pandemic, I kind of got a little bit antsy and bored. So I learned how to use Photoshop. Um, and so this is just me with Photoshop with all these squirrels walking around. Um, it's just a, a selfie from the, my camera. Because the camera's stationary, um, it's, you're going to have the same view, different seasons, so I can play around. And I think I got a dozen stories. They're obviously not out there at the same time. Well, they could be, but that's terrifying. <laughs> terrifying to swap a few stories like that. But you can see um, just 3,000, I had 3,000 squirrel images in, in 2019. Um, and then it went down to 1,000. And the last couple of years, I've had less than 100. I mean, just like not a lot of squirrels. Okay, so it's just a, it's a proxy for squirrel activity. It's a proxy for how many squirrels are out there on the landscape. You can go to Snapshot Wisconsin, type in Snapshot Wisconsin um, dashboard. Um, and again, I'm reluctant. Maybe I'll go back and do that after I get through this just to see if it works. But it'll give you all sorts of cool stuff on squirrels and bears and coyotes and, and all that from all the cameras around the state. Um, what I appreciate about iNaturalist, what I appreciate about Snapshot Wisconsin and GBIF, it's open data. It's like people aren't protecting their data. They're sharing their data. They want people to use their data. Okay? And so as a scientist, that's what I want. I, I don't want to protect my data. I want data to be used. Um, I'll give you, um, all right, so basically what, what was happening, it's super dark here, um, summer 2019 uh, was a mega mass year. You can look this up. So, um, so it's a mega mass year. If you have oak trees, you're probably being kept up um, because oaks were just crashing onto your, or, or acorns were crashing onto your roof and gutters all night. Uh, but 2017 also, uh, was a, a big mass year from a lot of tree species, um, sugar maples, white pine, red oak, uh, white and red spruce. So uh, we tend to think of mass with oak, but there's mass with maples. How many of you have a maple tree and all those little helicopters? You can collect in different, just a simple experiment that I haven't done yet, but I'm going to start. How many five-gallon buckets of of little helicopters and stems in my composting? Is it a half a bucket? Is it four buckets? And then I'll know, is it a mast year or not? Because if the maples are masting, I can start to think maybe the oaks are going to be masting. My spruce trees are going to be masting. My pine trees. Um, and that's a lot of food on the landscape. Okay. And so this was kind of a perfect storm of 2017 lots of squirrels, and then some mild winters, and so all the squirrels didn't die. And in spring of 2019, there wasn't a lot of food, but there were a lot of squirrels, and they started hitting the sugars, sugar bushes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we're not in a super high squirrel thing. So then I started, then I started getting in a little bit of a data tangent. I apologize. You asked me to talk, and then I got distracted. Um, so I put this talk together, and it's got a lot of kind of data in it. How many of you have heard of something called NEON? It's the National Ecological Observation Network. It's congressional. It's, it's funded for 30 years. There's 81 field sites across the country, including Hawaii. Um, we have one about an hour north here at Treehaven, uh, in, just outside of Rhineland or Tomahawk area. So. Um, Again, uh, their whole thing is open data. So you, we've got crews out there all summer. A lot of our students get hired on to NEON crews. 
Uh, they're doing small mammal stuff. They're doing ticks. They're doing plants. They're doing all sorts of stuff. There's towers. Um, there's towers collecting climate data. Um, and so I went in to the NEON open data portal, uh, which is a little bit trickier. And I pulled data from three field stations. Uh, this is Bartlett Field Station in New Hampshire because I wanted to know what's going on. That's the closest one to Vermont. They don't have one in Vermont. This is Tree Haven, which is our UWSP field station. And this is the University of Notre Dame's uh, environmental station, which is like just right up on the UP border uh, with, with Wisconsin. And I just wanted to ask the question because a lot of times people say that masking is synchronized and they synchronize over a large geographic area. So if it's, if it's masking in Vermont, it's masking in Wisconsin, it's masking in Oregon, right? that kind of thing. So I'm like, well, am I getting the same pattern in Wisconsin and Upper Peninsula, Michigan that I'm getting in New Hampshire and Vermont? Um, and so it's a little bit harder to read, but uh, pretty much you're, you're kind of seeing um, 2020 was like a big, what we call a ratata. Ratata is a great word, it's a South American word. It means an explosion of rodents. It's just an explosion of rodents. And, and, and what's driving the explosion of rodents? It's, it's, um, it's, it's what we call bottom up you know, um, uh, ecology. So you've got rain, you've got food, um, and then you get the food base being, so a squirrel is nothing more than a converted raycorn, acorn. So squirrels are just acorns. They were, okay? And bobcats are just squirrels. Um, they, they just convert that protein into bobcat uh, and so forth, okay? So, so you have to have that food base to have those, to have those squirrels. Uh, these aren't squirrels, these are all small mammals. So um, uh, you can kind of see, uh, again, this was 2019. So the, the small mammal population in New Hampshire wasn't big, but it was a masking year. So that following year, they were just everywhere. Just all that, all that mass was converted to rodent. Okay. And then I know too to check my house because I get mice in the basement in these kinds of years. When there's mice everywhere, I'm going to make double sure that, I, that I'm checking my house, putting traps in the basement. My wife finds the mouse and I don't. She's like, why the F did I marry a mammalogist if I'm finding the mice in the basement? What's the point? Okay. All right. So I was I was at a I was at say it was called first school. It was a it was a, a trapper education uh, workshop that the DNR put on for my students over at SLEDS this weekend. And there was a guy from the DNR that was giving a talk on um, wildlife diseases, and he was kind of he, he showed a picture. He's like. Uh, and would, that he thought, he's like, this is an abnormal behavior. There's clearly something wrong. This, this animal is sick. And so he shows this slide and he's like, what's, what's up with this squirrel? And I said, it's splooting. How many of you have ever seen a squirrel sploot? Why do squirrels sploot? It's really What? It's out. It's um, the, the, the funniest sploot that I saw. First of all, the word itself. Really, really sploot. It's a combination of splat and cute. <laughs> there was an article in the uh, Washington Post on just the word sploot. So, um, but it is cute and it's got a very, very specific um, uh, function. I was at a conference in, um, I think it was Manhattan, Kansas. It's the one with the prairie. It's the really hot one. I don't know. There's only two towns in Kansas that I really know about. Lawrence and Manhattan. So is Manhattan. Okay. And so the Kansas of prairies out there. Uh, it was 110 degrees. So we had some, some genius thought, hey, let's have our mammal conference in the middle of Kansas in the end of June. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, and, and so I'm on the campus at Kansas State, and um, I'm walking to one of the workshops. I'm just dripping. And this, this uh, fox squirrel, uh, that campus is all fox squirrels. Fox squirrel just runs past me in the sh into the shade and jumps on a concrete curb and just hugs it. And I could hear it. I could hear it say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it was just, 
it, it's it's a behavior called heat dumping. It's it's they 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 hug a cool surface to just dissipate, just dissipate heat. So you don't see splooting as much in Wisconsin, uh, but when they're hugging a branch, when they're hugging a cool rock, when they're hugging the curb in the shade, that's what they're doing. They're just dissipating heat. Okay. Um, but again, I love the I love the word. And I kind of I felt I'm like I didn't want to call the DNR guy out. So I'm like that's a that's a very normal behavior. It's not sick. It's not going to die. It's just splooting. <laughs> so um, squirrels. So I use squirrels in uh, in, in the classroom um, as as Susan said to basically teach my students job readiness skills. We actually have a paper coming out. Um, in the Journal of Mammalogy on, on just that. Um, but we developed, my colleagues and I around the country developed a number of modules, a number of squirrel behavior things that you can do with your students in the classroom. This one uh, uses a, a, something called getting up density, and I'll explain that a little bit, um, well, right now. But uh, giving up density, um, gets into something called optimal foraging. It's like how long, um, how long is a squirrel going to um, spend foraging for seeds on a patch before it gives up? Before it says, that next seed is just not worth it to me. Um, it's, or it's, um, and so the trade-off is between foraging and vigilance because the squirrel's in danger of being eaten, right? So you've got predators on the landscape, and so when its head is down foraging, its head is not up looking. Now squirrels actually do something called alert foraging. If you've ever watched a squirrel eat, how does it eat? It doesn't eat with its head down. It picks up the nut, it sits there on its hunches, and it kind of nibbles and eats and looks around. So it kind of does both. It's called, we, we called it alert foraging because it's, um, it's kind of a unique squirrely thing to do. But what we did, what we did, and this, this comes from some work by a guy named um, Joel Brown uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago, came up with this really cool technique. It's like you can measure um, something in what's called the landscape of fear. If you've got predators on the landscape, it changes the behavior of the prey. The classic example that you've probably heard about is wolves in Yellowstone. When they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, the wolves would eat, eat some of the elk. But more importantly, they changed the behavior of the elk. The elk no longer stayed in the valleys, they moved up in, into the woods and it allowed the valleys and the aspen to come back and you may have heard this story. But it wasn't the direct predation on the elk that was the, the interesting, the most interesting thing. It was the way that the elk changed their behavior in response to the predator on the landscape. And that can be measured, okay? And, and so this is on a smaller scale. We don't have, we have wolves and elk, but it's not a practical field experiment for my students to do for a semester. Let's go out and look at wolves and elk. We can look at seeds and squirrels though. Plenty of squirrels um, on campus, plenty of squirrels in town. And that's true on college campuses around the country. And so we just said, hey, let's get college students from around the country to do a single experiment. Everyone that's enrolled in our class does the experiment and classes around the country do the experiment. And so we, what we have here are seed trays with play sand. Um, we can put those, uh, all of them have three liters of sand and 10 grams of um, un, like shelled sunflower seeds, like sunflower seeds without the shell, so they don't have to open them up. You mix that in the matrix, and then you put them in different places. This one's put really close to a tree. This one's kind of put about 10 feet from a tree. There's another tree that's maybe another 10 feet from there. So you can, um, you can put them on college campuses, you can put them in the middle of a city, you can put them in a desert. So wherever you put these trays, you just write, we have a, a whole sheet that you fill out. Um, and, uh, and then you bring it in after eight hours, you sift that sand, you weigh the seeds. How much is left is called the giving up density. That's how much seed the squirrel left in the tray. That's kind of what it is, okay. So we're measuring this trade off between foraging and vigilance. Um, and asking the question, is there a difference in species? Is there a difference in habitats and stuff like that? Um, so right now we've got about 14 institutions, 1,200 trays, six squirrel species, various habitats. We published this in um, uh, the uh, 
2020 is when we got these published, right early on, then the pandemic hit. And right away, people were like, you know what? This works really well remotely. We had two modules that just were designed for remote learning, that students anywhere in the country that didn't have to be in a university, they could go out and observe squirrels, they could go out and measure this. And one of our modules, not this one, um, went from like 10 institutions to 27 institutions in one semester because every institution was like, we can do this remotely. They just have to go out and look at squirrels, enter the data, we'll download all the data, and then we can do um, remote presentations. And it was really good. So the pandemic kind of helped our data set um, immensely. Uh, but here's our pointer students. And then we've got um, uh, a bunch from uh, Louisiana State. Uh, what I love about this, a lot of uh, community colleges can get involved in this. They, they might not have a lot of resources, but they can do our modules and share our data. Um, it's very collaborative, which, which is the other thing um, I was looking at. I'll just, I won't show so much of this data, um, but this is just, I was playing around with the new stats program. All this is showing is if there's 10 grams left in the tray and I started with 10 grams, that just means the squirrel either didn't discover the tray or just took a couple like nibbles and ran away. Okay. And so most of the trays don't have, you know, just a little bit eaten. Okay. Uh, but then there's some trays, everything was eaten. You get there, you sift it, and there's not a single seed left. They ate everything. Okay. So, but you get this a very similar pattern. Most, a lot of gray squirrels, uh, not a lot of California ground squirrels. That's kind of what that's showing. Uh, we're just picking up some Western grays now. Uh, some of the colleges, there's um, Oregon. Um, what I also learned is there's colleges in Oregon, like Gonzaga, um, which is a three seed in the NCAA tournament. I don't know if you guys like basketball. Yeah. Um, what is the two seed? Marquette. My wife went, my wife went to Marquette, so we're, we're, we're going to be following Marquette. Um, but Gonzaga has a bunch of gray squirrels. It's like, that's like out west. What are they doing with eastern gray squirrels in, in the western state? And so there's some weird stuff going on um, with eastern and western gray squirrels. What do we have here? Gray squirrels. We have eastern gray squirrels. Almost everything you see running around outside right now that's a tree squirrel is a, an eastern gray squirrel. What's the difference? Ones in the um, I like morphologic or shape wise, I don't know who does though, yeah. The black squirrel is uh yeah, it's a variant of the eastern gray squirrel. Now we have interestingly, we have black morphs of eastern chipmunks. So that's the question. They're really cool. It's like a chipmunk that's like completely black. And the ones that I have have like a white patch, like a wolverine. On the chest, I'm like, that is so cool. Um, but someone gave them to me because they don't like chipmunks. So I'm like, I'll take those. Those are great. Um, fox squirrels are like larger and, and redder. We have them around here, but for every hundred eastern gray squirrels, I might see one fox squirrel. So that, um, gray squirrels here are, are king. And then, of course, we have red squirrels. Um, so in my backyard, I live right by the university, just about a, a mile from here. I have eastern chipmunks, eastern gray squirrels. I have red squirrels. I have um, woodchuck that like burrows under my, what do you call that, compost heap. I have one other one. Five. Oh, my favorite. 13 line ground squirrels. Oh my gosh, they're so adorable. Okay. <laughs> because they're like families. They're little families that live in your lawn. And, and, and you'll see grandma. And it's grandma, I guarantee it's grandma. She'll sit up on her little hind legs when you go down and drop something in the compost pile. She'll start screaming, like, there he is, there he is. And like everything runs away. You know, grandma just watching it with a you know, and, um, and there's good data to support that it's grandma. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Is a squirrel a squirrel? Totally a squirrel. The one that people didn't think was a squirrel was a woodchuck. So the woodchuck is actually our largest squirrel. It's a ground squirrel. Okay. Um, but yes, flying squirrels. And people thought woodchucks were gophers. Completely not true. So gophers are gophers, different family. Woodchucks are squirrels. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, we call them, we, that's one of these weird, weird things with common names. We call anything that goes in the ground a gopher. Um, and that's just kind of a, just a misnomer, okay? So we have gophers, that's the family Geomyidae. Our Plains pocket gopher is kind of in the Western part of the state, totally not a squirrel. It's more closely related to the beavers and the kangaroo rats than it is the squirrels. So it's just a weird thing, but they're fossorial, right? They dig underground and that's kind of where they live. Uh, so we call a lot of those things gophers uh, because they're gophery in the way that they dig. Okay. But, um, but good, that's, that's a very common um, thing that people call them. So anyway. So I was interested not just in the distribution, but are, is there actually a statistical variation? And I'm not, this is not about data, but we can kind of see um, that whatever this is, uh, red squirrels, okay. If you know your red squirrels, red squirrels are fearless. Red squirrels, they're gonna run up to you. They're, if, you're, if you're near their tree, they're gonna let you know it. If you're in their, in their tree, if you're a hunter, and you're in a tree stand, they'll let everything know it. He's right here. She's right here. I've had students say that a red squirrel came down and bit him on the top of the head. <laughs> Get out of my tree. Okay. So uh, this is kind of, you know, they're, they're they, this tells me they're a little bit more fearless, right? They're, um, they're going to stay on that path a little bit longer than your other squirrels. Um, and uh, just, uh, just, that's, that's um, what I mean by landscape of fear. Um, these California brown squirrels, super skittish. You know, they're like, they're gonna go out of their burrow, take a few nibbles, run back in. Go out of their burrow, take a few nibbles, run back in. So, uh, brown squirrel, um, and, and that's kind of what this data is showing. Um, and then uh, what you can't see here, so this is cover. So this is like, um, if I put that tree right next to the tree or right next to a burrow, where they can just come down the tree and the food's right there, that's like um, close to cover, they're gonna stay on that tray a lot longer. It's like, okay, I can escape. My burrow's right there, okay? If something comes for me, I can get away. If there's no cover or the cover is kind of far, they're not gonna stay on that tray that long. It's a little bit too risky for them to be exposed for a long period of time. Okay? And so that's what this data is showing. But again, what I love about the data isn't the data itself, is that the data were collected by undergraduate students around the entire country over the last three years, even during the pandemic. And now we're all sharing that data um, and it'll probably end up in some publications. Okay, so we're toward the end here. I don't know if this is gonna work, but you may have seen um, uh, all sorts of really cool elaborate things you can do for squirrels. A lot of people have just been like, I'm going to try to figure out a way to keep squirrels in my, out of my bird feeders. And then some people are like, are like, you know what? Squirrels are here. Let's embrace the squirrels and, and build Fort Nuts. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and one of my favorites is that, and I kind of want to make a few of these, these cute little squirrel picnic tables are just like adorable. You can buy them on Etsy, but I'd rather just try to make one. You put it on a tree. Um, Put a trail camera out there and get all sorts of your cute little stuff. <laughs> um, you may have seen some of these. I'll, I'll, I'll show one. There was a, uh, a documentary, uh, uh, a Nova documentary on squirrels. I can't remember what it was called. Um, anyway, so this is just a segment from that documentary. We're going to try to see if this works. Um, it might be a little bit slow. But taking one way of getting. Problem. By their desire yeah, for not. It's like so cool. But again, <laughs> they find persistence, bigger, memory. Not just to remember what the seeds are.
in the, the DNR and, and just kind of like look and I'll, I'll probably find patterns where it's not just my camera that doesn't have a lot of squirrels, it's 2,000 cameras. They're all in my house. They're all coming to my house. Yes. Territorial. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. Um, yes. some more than, you know. What I, what I love watching just off my back video <laughs> is the red squirrels and how territorial they are. Now, see my gray squirrels come out of their little tree, cross my yard, and then end up at the Norway spruce that I have lining lot Q over there, which is where my red squirrels um, are. And then I'll see three gray squirrels just shoot back across the yard with a little red squirrel just saying, get out. It's <laughs> So, uh, yeah, they are. They are territorial. So, good question. Yeah. What if you relocate them? Um, what if you like just kind of trap your squirrel and let it go somewhere else? Um, you're you're probably putting it into another squirrel's territory, and they're going to duke it out. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah. It's, so, will they live? Of course, the little long happy life. Because no, I no, they're I don't know. Um, I do know that you've you know that your squirrels will disperse. Okay, so so male squirrels like the young young males uh, are going to disperse. They're going to leave and they're going to go find territory. So dispersal is natural, but dispersal is risky. They're going to disperse into another squirrel's territory. And they're going to have to um, deal with um, that competition. What's the life expectancy? A couple years. Two, let's say two to three years, and, and kind of a normal squirrel like. Right? Okay. In captivity, um, probably seven, eight years. Ten years. Ten, yeah, in, in captivity. In captivity. Um, I, I know people like uh, flying squirrels down south as pets. I don't know if people are weird. If you have a flying squirrel, I apologize. No, I don't. I don't. You're weird. You have a flying squirrel? Oh, okay. Oh, did you hear? Uh, did you hear? Like, um, so one of my former students, Eric Olson, up at Northland um, College uh, up in Ashland, he and his undergraduate and their faculty published a paper that that flying squirrels glow, that they fluoresce. It was in the New York Times. It was like a big deal. And and so if you take a and so one of their faculty had like a like a UV headlamp on. And, and in the middle of the night, you saw like a flying squirrel and it was pink. It's like, that's weird. It's like fluorescing. So the, the belly hair was fluorescing back. It's like your solid owls. Solid owls do that too? They have that, yeah. yeah. They have that. You, you can only see with the UV light. So and that's how we. They don't know why. Them. It's just a weird thing. So they went into museum collections. They went down to Chicago and they just like took pictures of like um, all these flying squirrels under UV light. It's like, yep, sure enough. <laughs> they all for us. So I started doing that in my in my collection too, just to show the students how how flying squirrels for us. And then you started seeing all these weird papers popping up. Everyone that had a mammal collection would just go into their collection with the UV light and just shine it on everything. And then you see, oh, like there was a paper just came out on platypus, platypus um um fluorescent in the ultraviolet. Okay, so so they found one. So yeah, there was all because Eric Olson up at up at Northern College, a former pointer, just like found <laughs> this and flying squirrels. Yeah, super bizarre. Um, yeah. That's really about black squirrels, and you can pretty much tell apart by the amount of fur that they would be getting to lose around their face, especially if they had ears. But the gray squirrels weren't having a problem with that at all. Do they have mange? Huh. Or is there a specific type of mange? I don't know. Someone kind of came in and all freaked out last semester. Uh, they had a squirrel with squirrel pox. They thought it was like the end of the world. And if you've ever seen squirrel pox, it's pretty frightening. It's like zombie squirrel apocalypse kind of stuff. It's pretty scary. But um, no, there was no squirrel pox outbreak. And there was no mange outbreak. It was just like a squirrel with pox. And it looks but no, I hadn't heard that about. Um, maybe mange is just, yeah, it just it, it, it got some light. Right. Usually, when something has mange, though, it's not just like localized, it's like mange. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and people have, 
because squirrels are so visible and they're active during the day, we have these kinds of uh, you know, observations with squirrels here. Right now. So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Do they hibernate like a couple of days and then go out and forage? And how, how is that? Because I don't see them out all the time. Um, they're uh, tree squirrels, don't, so certainly the ground squirrels hibernate. Right? Um, and, and so those chipmunks, they seem to disappear in October and then. There's a contest, you know, my, my friends down at the Urban Ecology Center, and most ecology centers I know or nature centers have their first chipmunk of the year. A lot of people, and I don't understand, you know, this thing that people like are looking for the first robin of the year, like that's a thing. I'm just kidding. That is totally a thing, right? So um, so we're always looking for that first robin. That's that's a sign of spring. For mammalogists, it's the chipmunks and the and the 13 line ground squirrels. I'm looking for the ground squirrels coming out of their burrows, and then my heart just sinks. Oh, they're back, they're back. But so they're gonna they're gonna hibernate. Um, gray squirrels, they, they've got their big leaf nests up in the oak trees, um, and they can I, I, I don't call it hibernating, they'll just pump it down. If it's not, you know, if it's if they're gonna lose more energy foraging, they're just gonna stay put, you know. So if it's warmer, I remember a warm day in February, I had five of them um, come out of that nest. Three siblings, two blacks, um, but they're just like all chasing around and the red squirrels chasing out of the trees. And, and it was just like I, I wanted to go get my camera. I'm like, this is just a squirrel party back here. So so they weren't losing all that energy. They were just playing. And it looked to me like playing. You know, they're just like, I've been balled up in this leaf nest for three days. So I'm gonna go off and run around in the yard and get, see if I can beat that red squirrel finally. But yeah, so um. Yeah, they, they'll just hunt it on. Um, mammals have a lot of cool, and I think they're bats. They'll just shut down every day. You know, you'll see it on the side of a, a brick wall and students will think it's dead and die there. I'm like, no, it's just literally chilling. It's just, just chilling on the wall, drops its body temperature for the day, just chose a poor spot to do it where it's visible. You know, I can literally just uh, put a glove on. I can it off the wall, go put it on a tree where it's safe, which is what I'll do. Um, and then I check in the next day and it's gone. It's like it wakes up, it's like this isn't where I landed. It's like okay. <laughs> it's like oh the night I've had. Yeah. So, anyway, any other questions? I, I this is you get you guys ask so many more questions than most people do. So <laughs> The reason why the Russian only had that is that John spread all the countries in the most important area. So you can see himself. So they were, um, so I grew up in Milwaukee at the same time. So, um, and those neighborhoods with all those at home, they're all gray squirrels. Uh, and, uh, and so I grew up, and they were all named. Chipper was my favorite. Chipper would come out. My dad made the mistake of feeding Chipper, and so he came out of the. He came out to go to work one day, and Chipper just ran right across the street, right up my dad's pant leg, um, just just run around. It's like, where's the food? My dad's like, what the hell? He's like, well, you did this to yourself, Dad. Um, by, by, by feeding Chipper. Um, but yeah, you could. You had all those tame urban squirrels as kids. You could. You could talk to them. You could call them in. You could. Pretty much feed them out of your hand. Um, and, and I do remember as a kid there being just lots of gray squirrels in the neighborhood, and lots and lots of Dutch home, or not lots of American home. Right? Um, so, yeah, and I don't know. I hadn't heard that Madison was a fox squirrel town. Yeah. Big orange squirrels. <laughs> yeah. Is that still true? Is, is Madison still more fox squirrel than a red squirrel or a gray squirrel? I'll have, to, I'll have to pay attention next time I'm down there. How many sets of babies do they have in a year? Oh, good question. I don't know. Maybe maybe in good years they'll have two litters. The old years they'll have one. But you would think, because I'm a professional and I'm honest, that I would know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I will just kind of stick with my answer of one or two. <laughs> so do they have us in the spring? When do they have their babies? Um, April. 
Yeah, I think they'll, like, if they're in September, or something. Yeah, they'll, they'll uh, right around, yeah, in um, May. And my goodness, you got <laughs> three, four, maybe ish. <laughs> um, probably, I, I'm, I'm going to get they'd probably be in the body size of about a eight to four week gestation. Um, and I could. I was and they're nursed, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. we're mammals. So I, I can certainly yeah. answer that question. <laughs> no, um, and it's not even all lines. If you actually look at the pattern, you know, on the brown schools, lines and spots, really beautiful pattern. Um, I've never counted them though. I gotta count them. Thing. Not only do you ask more questions, you ask harder questions. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 That squirrel in my in my lawn tells me that this is a nice, happy place to be. You know, it's not a chem lawn. I, none of my neighbors that have chem lawns have, have their chem lawns. And maybe you have a chem lawn and have their chem lawns, and so I, I just don't know. But I've got lots of clover and lots of dandelion and lots of lots of stuff um, there, but it's just um, not a lot of chemicals. I mulch all my grass back into the, into the lawn. It's just like... Good, it's good habitat back there. Or as good, good as I can do for being in the city. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, looking forward to my 13 lines. Yeah. Well, thanks you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for navigating. Oh, yeah, we got yeah. it to work. So that's yeah. the important thing. Our next program is, well, we have our field trip coming up, so if you come online for that, it does, does help to sign up for those because I do send them to the field trip leaders so they can kind of expect to not leave too early if they know there's more people coming. It's kind of good to get that heads up. I'll send that book to them. You can sign up online, um, or you can contact the tour leaders directly. So. And then our next month's speaker is John Munson talking about South Africa. So April 19th at 7 p.m. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Have a good day. Thank you.